Hey everybody, my name's Adam and it's Christmas break right now. I'm at my parents' place and still working, still making videos. Why am I making videos? Well, it's because I'm, I'm terrified that if I stop making videos, then the algorithm will stop promoting my videos to people and then I'll stop being relevant and the only thing that has brought me success in my life will go away. So I have to work with no end in sight. Just this work, a slave to the digital machine of content creation. Over and over and over again, the wheel turns, being sucked up into the content maw. Why am I here? Why is anybody here? I hope you enjoy the super fast Instagram QA. Super fast Instagram QA. How does one make lo-fi hip hop? Thanks. Well, honestly, I just go on Splice and download a lo-fi hip hop drum beat. I cut it up occasionally, and then I play some jazz chords on top of it. And then I play some jazz chords on top of it. Jazz chords on top of it. Jazz chords on top of it. On top. On top. On top. On top. On top. I'm sure there are lo-fi hip hop connoisseurs out there that have some other things they do, but honestly, I, I don't spend that much time thinking about it. <laughs> Is that bad? It's probably bad. Do you want to collaborate with Davey504? Bass. Bass. That tagline, by the way, that was mine first. How do you think people with perfect pitch feel about microtonal stuff? Yeah, so my microtonal lo-fi hip-hop album got a little bit of a mixed response from people with perfect pitch who expect A to sound like this and C to sound like this. Different tuning systems by their very nature have a wildly different chroma, like color to them. And for people with perfect pitch, I honestly can't imagine how that would feel. Your entire life is based on this tuning system and the way that your brain is organized and understanding how the notes are supposed to sound like just kind of goes out the window. And I imagine it would be quite disconcerting, like even stranger and more disconcerting for the rest of us who might not have perfect pitch, but really know what the sound of 12 tone equal temperament actually is supposed to sound like. And my friend Tyreek has perfect pitch where he can accurately place frequencies with letter names within our 12 tone system. And this is what he had to say about the microtonal music. This is doing all kinds of stuff to my mind brain. Distorted color monsters doing the two-step kinda. Love it. From what I understand, Jacob Collier actually also has perfect pitch, and he experiments all the time with different kinds of intonation and tuning schemes. So I'd imagine, even if the music is very, very strange and a deep level to him, distorted color monsters doing the two-step, the tuning stuff felt good enough to use in the music. Are you good at piano? You play it a lot in your videos. I'm okay at this instrument. I'm not bad at it, but not great. It's a lot easier to express musical ideas on video through piano than it is on bass. More people are familiar with the layout of piano. Western music theory is normally taught in a very piano-centric way. So I thought, if I'm gonna be like a music theory YouTuber, uh, I probably should get a little bit better at piano if I'm gonna deliver these music theory sermons to people every week. <laughs> Piano. Any opinions on Pink Floyd's money being considered jazz? Uh, saxophone and odd time signatures does not jazz make, but it is pretty cool. C major seven sharp 11. Ladies and gentlemen, C major seven sharp 11. Also 13, because I'm feeling spicy. What's your opinion about rhythm games becoming a media to enjoy the song? Honestly, I know very little about rhythm games, but if getting people engaged with the music by moving their bodies along to it makes them appreciate the music more, sure, that'd be cool. Why not? Hi, I'm 13 and I want to learn about jazz. What should I do? So the book that I've been recommending people who want to approach jazz for the first time is Ted Joya's How to Listen to Jazz. In the book, he teaches you how to listen to jazz. It's a good book. Song, album of the decade. H. John Benjamin's Well I Should Have. Motown or Atlantic? I am a fan of Motown. Motown's cool. Hablas Espanol? Un poquito. Is music profitable and satisfying in the long term? Is strictly jazz or should I diversify? First of all, don't go into music to be 
profitable or to make money. Go into music because you have to make music. And to do anything else would leave you unfulfilled and just wondering, what if? That said, you can make money and it is immensely satisfying to do so in music, but you can't approach any decision making out of fear. Making decisions out of fear, not necessity by the way, but the fear of not making enough money doing something just leads you to doing something else which might not be as fulfilling and will leave you dead inside. And that, my friends, would be Moy mal. What are the practical uses of microtones? So yeah, I mean, whenever a guitarist does that half step bend from the fourth degree of the scale, not quite all the way up to that flat five degree in a blues lick. That's a practical use of microtones. Classic rock musicians have been somewhat zen harmonic for decades, but we haven't been calling it that. But it's kind of what it is. How do you overcome making repeating rhythms slash staying fresh and new while composing? I think it's important to learn things by ear and transcribe different rhythms and things that excite you in music that you're listening to. If you're constantly learning and embodying different rhythms, you won't run out of ideas because they already physically will be inside you because you've already learned how to perform them. Who's your favorite make jazz vocalist of all time? I'm assuming that's male jazz vocalist, uh, Johnny Hartman. He sounds really nice. Is it hard to play with two drummers in one band? Yeah, so on Sungazer's tour, we did a bunch of double drummer gigs. We had Sean, the drummer for Sungazer, as well as our buddy Josh Bailey playing like auxiliary drum set. And honestly, for me as a bass player, I freaking love playing with two drummers. It's awesome. Especially if the drummers are really locked in and improvising and playing a lot of different notes and feeding off of each other. It feels like the rhythm section that normally was just you as a bass player and a drummer now has three people in it. And what's better than two people? Well, Three people. Uh, yes, it is a very kinky thing for a bass player to play with two drummers. There's, of course, plenty of dangers with playing with two drummers. The first is flams. Tiny differences between two drums hitting at the same time. Now, marching percussionists deal with this sort of thing all the time, so drummers know to look out for flams, but it's still this, like, little danger there that will crop up. The other obvious thing that's an issue is sound guys hate it. They don't know how to deal with two kick drums and two snare drums, and unless you really know what you're doing and know how to balance everything and know the roles of each drummer within the ensemble, it can be just the worst sound experience. But honestly, guys, honestly. Playing in a band with two drummers is absolutely awesome, and I honestly would rather play in a band with two drummers that are really good and locked in than two guitarists that are really good and locked in. For most styles of music, it makes less practical sense to do that, but for me, just my heart is in hearing that fusillade of notes coming from either side of me as I'm playing bass. It's, uh, it's quite fun. Fusillade, by the way, I believe is the most appropriate noun to describe. Uh, describe the situation. It is quite the fusillade. Fusillade. It's a good word. Have you ever listened to Greek music? Yeah, I did a little bit of research into Greek music for my How to Play Music in 9-8 video. And the thing, of course, that struck me is that Greek music, not just traditional music, but also pop music, is in odd meters. The whole concept of dancing in short and long steps really makes sense with the odd meter music. It's not like all the music is prog rock where it's odd meters for the sake of odd meters. But rather, the odd meters fundamentally serve dancing which I think is super, super cool and something that most musicians aren't thinking about all the time when they go into odd meter territory. It's more like, hey, look what I can do. I can play odd meters, which is fun. I don't fault anybody for doing that, but I think it's super cool that in Greek music, the odd meters serve the dance. What kept microtonality from being the norm in Western music? Was 12 Tet just the vibe? Okay, so a book by Ross W. Duffin that I just finished reading is called How Equal Temperament Ruined Harmony and Why You Should Care. It's a little bit of a clickbaity title, uh, kudos to you, Ross, for playing the game. Very important. But it does a really good job of tracing the history on how we got to equal temperament, because for the better part of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, we used many, many different kinds of systems. More than that, different instruments used different kinds of systems depending on what combination of instruments would be playing. Basically, as piano became more and more the default instrument, like why I'm having to play piano right now on this YouTube channel, 12-tone equal temperament became more and more solidified. It also allowed more complex harmony to exist like jazz harmony as well as 12 tone serialist music. So in a lot of ways, I think it's actually been a good thing and I don't feel like it ruined harmony like this book says, but it's a good book to read anyway just to get an understanding of how we got to the place where we are right now. Why haven't we seen a microtonal jazz fusion cover of Single Ladies in 420 yet? <laughs> oh, it's coming guys. It's coming. How to develop a good work ethic with practicing. Do it every day. Five minutes a day is better than nothing. Habits are hard to break, even good habits. So once you get in the habit of doing something, you won't want to stop doing it, especially if you start seeing the results. And daily practice will make you better at music, 
so you'll probably keep the habit. Is it more important to study theory or practice technique? Well, it kind of depends on what you want to do, but for most of us, the analysis of music, divorced from performing it and living it and experiencing it, that's kind of useless by itself. Knowing how to wiggle your fingers impressively on your instrument without any kind of broader context on what that finger wiggling means or what the finger wiggling makes people feel when you do it, that, uh, that also isn't quite as useful. Now, I think the most important thing, honestly, to focus on, broad strokes, is ear training, because it brings in the theoretical approach to understanding music as well as the tactile approach to understanding music. Hearing this... You could analyze it as a descending arpeggio of a major seven chord in second inversion, but also hearing this, you could hear it and also imagine how you might play it on your instrument. In this way, practicing technique on your instrument and also understanding music analytically come together in a very practical unified theory of music education, and that is ear training. Thoughts on thank you scientists. They are really really good. What am I supposed to be thinking about musically while soloing? Yeah, so you really shouldn't be thinking consciously about what it is that you're doing while you're improvising. Although you should still be very focused in on what you're doing, and you should be focused in on what other people are doing. What I mean by that is you shouldn't be thinking about each individual musical element as it's happening in the moment. There's a time and place for that, and that's when you're practicing. When you're practicing, you might be working out a complicated idea, like a C scale in broken thirds. I might think, okay, G, E, D, F, E, C, B, D, C, A, etc. Eventually you'll get it so you don't have to think about it so much and it just becomes muscle memory. And this muscle memory is the thing that you'll rely upon when you're actually improvising in the moment. Basically what I'm trying to say is when we're improvising, we're not thinking, we're letting our bodies think for us. We're in expressing a musical idea through ourselves, literally, not through a conscious thought provided that we have trained our bodies musically well. How do you write down velocity more accurately in sheet music? Piano to forte doesn't always cut it. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, the traditional gradient for dynamics, how loud you're supposed to be playing according to sheet music goes pianissimo, as quiet as possible, piano, quiet, mezzo piano, a little quiet, mezzo forte, a little loud, forte, loud, and fortissimo, as loud as possible. Now there's some outlier dynamic markings like triple or quadruple F, but for the most part, we have a gradient of six total values for or loudness. Now, for people who have grown up in digital audio workstations, who've grown up with velocity, where you have 128 values of dynamic range, this seems ridiculous. Now, here's the thing. Dynamic markings are meant to communicate something from a composer to a performer via sheet music. Ideally, the composer should tell the performer what notes to play and some guideline on how to play them. It's in the composer's best interest to not get too micromanagey with these details, like specifying specific velocity numbers with which to play the piano, for example. I'm not sure if any performer would be able to reliably do that. It's an interesting thought, but at the same time, there just isn't any point to it. Do you think that the future of music is going to be defined by the digital audio workstations that become available? I definitely agree with that sentiment. Digital audio workstations are musical instruments for the 21st century. I think it would be really, really cool if parents didn't just get kids piano lessons, which I think can be very important and useful, but also get those kids digital audio workstation lessons. I don't think that's gonna happen for a while, but I truly believe that the value of digital audio workstations hasn't fully been appreciated quite yet. Why all the microtonal stuff lately? Because I think it's fun, it gets me inspired, and yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's amusing. It's amusing to me. What are your thoughts about Simon Franzman? Simon animated the bass tag at the end of every one of my videos. Bass. He is both a genius memer and a great musician. We are not worthy of his talent. Any relation to composer Blake Neely? None whatsoever but he has a good choice in last name. How do you internalize quintuplets? Quintuplets can be kind of tricky to get into because most of the time when we're listening to music, we're listening to music that has broken the beat down into groups of two or three or four, not five. Fortunately, Sean Crowder, the drummer for Sungazer, has created a playlist that you can check out in the description of all these songs that use quintuplets or quintuplet swing to help at least get your ear acclimated to what that feels like. It won't make you play quintuplets better, but it will at least get you more into the sound of things. Favorite Bernstein musical and why? Yeah, so I think he did only two musicals. He did West Side Story and he did On the Town. West Side Story, of course, is a very serious retelling of Romeo and Juliet, as serious as you can be with dancing gangsters. But On the Town is a goofy musical about a bunch of sailors who are on shore leave for 24 hours in New York City. And honestly, I kind of like On the Town better. A lot of people don't like musical theater because they find it cheesy, but please listen to On the Town, uh, the original cast recording. The orchestrations are 
unbelievable. Why aren't resonator guitars used in jazz anymore? How do they become a blues staple? That's an interesting question. I've heard a lot of different instruments in jazz music, some working better than others. Like for example, don't really recommend listening to jazz bagpipes, but I've never really heard a resonator guitar used in a jazz context. And I can imagine it would sound cool, but I've never heard it. So if anybody has any examples of jazz resonator guitar to send me, uh, let me know. That'd be really cool. Stop showing up in my nightmares, please. Hey Adam, here is something I wondered about. What key is Rihanna's umbrella in? B minor? First of all, I think you mean B flat minor, not B minor, just saying that. Anyway, so umbrella is one of those four chords of pop music songs. We got G flat, D flat, A flat, B flat minor which is one of those cycles, which in various incarnations is used over and over and over again in many different kinds of pop songs. There's this great article by Mark Richards called Tonal Ambiguity in Popular Music's Axis Progressions, which was named for the Axis of Awesome compilation, which used the songs, which used this progression over and over again. And in the article, there's actually a fair amount of analysis of Rihanna's umbrella. Part of what makes the progression so interesting is the tonal ambiguity, especially when paired with fairly tonally ambiguous melodies. I talked a little bit about this in my What Key is Sweet Home Alabama in video, but basically you get to situations where they're really kind of like two tonics occurring at the same time. So it's a little ambiguous. Are we in major? Are we in minor? Are we in both? This kind of ambiguity is incredibly common in modern pop music. In fact, at the end of the article, it talks about the fusion of both major and Aeolian elements that has become the signature sound of the post-classic era in popular music. Ever played Jazz Crimes by Joshua Redman? Learned the melody? I have. It's a really hard song, and the bass line is a 12-tone row. Fun fact. Why is music theory so daunting to learn? Well, it's because it's a whole language. I don't know about you, but learning a new language can be incredibly daunting for me, especially among native speakers. There's so much detail and so much stuff to learn, and it can be completely overwhelming if you're approaching the entire thing at once. But if you start with the basics and are able to have conversations in this language with other people, it becomes a lot easier to speak it. Now, this channel and what I do here is not really designed to teach you the language of music theory. Rather, it's a channel to have discussions with people using the language of music theory analysis. If you don't know any music theory and you're hearing me talk about things like C minor 9 flat 5, it might sound like somebody talking Japanese to you. That in itself is not very useful for a beginning Japanese learner. However, surrounding yourself with the sound of Japanese definitely is useful for a beginning Japanese learner. Anyway, by thinking about music theory as a language and relating it to how you think about languages, I think that gives you a better perspective on how to think about it. Can you play the lick one million times when you hit one million subscribers? I've thought about what I'm gonna do when I hit one million subscribers, and I'm not gonna reveal that yet, but if you guys have any suggestions on what you would like me to do when I hit one million subscribers besides this lovely idea, please let me know in the comment section. Thank you. What pop artist has the best music in your opinion? Carly Rae Jepsen. Only half kidding. Is Sungazer ever touring again? Yes, we definitely are. We're actually in a couple weeks gonna be touring as support for Moon Hooch. Go check out my website for all the gigs that I'll be playing with Sungazer and other gigs over the coming months. Uh, I'm very excited for the Moon Hooch tour. We're gonna be touring a lot more in the coming year. Peace.